but let's talk a little bit then about this incoming uh, this incoming uh, recruiting class. Here's where I think people. People get this a little bit confused, Saul, in that there are the freshmen that come in and they are immediate difference makers. Those are your top three, top four players. Your Mike Bibbies, your DeAndre Aytons, dudes like that that just come in and they're different. If you're a top 15 to 25 kid, you still probably have an NBA future if things go right, but it's going to take a little bit longer. Let's use Carter Bryant, for example. I had a lot of people asking me about Carter Bryant in the McDonald's All-American game. Carter Bryant, to me, is a two-year player. And so a two-year player to me translates generally to somebody that's going to be about 10 and 10 and 3, 10 and 4 as a freshman. And then you make that jump a little bit like a KJ Lewis. That is yeah. kind of what I'm looking at. And all these dudes coming in, and we'll go one by one. If you're expecting DeAndre Ayton next year, no, you're not going to get that. That's going to be somebody from the transfer portal or somebody like that. 10 and 4 is nothing to and then is this, you know, in that second year, then they become a monster, Saul. I, I, and honestly, like, I'm not even looking for anything in the first 10 games of the season. Like, right. if they give you something cool, uh, but you're looking for something as they develop. KJ, I thought, developed over the year, um, really started to learn his role. And I actually thought he he, sh he could take a couple more shots I from agree. the perimeter, um, especially in L.A. I thought that he was shooting the ball in practice very, very well. And then the first, the only, I think the only three that he took in, in that game he hit, so I think there's there's potential for KJ Lewis's growth and that picture of growth to be copied onto a Carter Bryant, for right. example. Like mm -hmm. I think that that's a, a good picture to move forward with. And yeah, I mean, listen to your point with when you have COVID throw such a monkey wrench into everything and the development of players and the 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 age of players yeah. and the experience of players and the maturity of players becoming a, a significant factor, you're not going to see here in the next two or three years that McDonald's one hit wonder as much as you did before, right. because there's just, there's just too much, too many experienced players out there right now. Now we fast forward to two years, everything's going to throttle back and then you'll see it again, but it's going to be a little bit. Now, Joson Sainon, on another one. Um, he's, he's a little bit different to me in that. I think he's probably, he's got a good chance of stepping into that shooting guard position. This is just a guess, but I think you could see him next to KJ Lewis on the perimeter. Saint on to me is you watch his highlights. And again, I'm not going to pretend like, you know, I've had boots on the ground watching him, but you watch his highlights and he's somebody that can get, get to the basket. He's already showing up on NBA draft charts. He to me is fascinating, but again, a lot of these guys I still think are going to be drafted on potential, Saul. He, I think there's more of a chance of him being a one-and-done because he's physically more ready. But again, this isn't going to be a Mike Bibby spot. This is probably going to be somebody that could maybe get you 11 points, 3-4 assists, 3-4 rebounds, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. I think he would kind of, to me, he he's a hybrid of Michael Dickerson and Richard Jefferson. I'll take it. I feel like those two together – um, some of their skill sets, the way they approach the game, their bounce on the court, the way they moved around the court. I, that's kind of what he reminds me of a little bit mm -hmm. um, because I didn't, I don't feel like he has the quickness of a Michael Dickerson, um, but he does have the explosiveness still, right. just not at that level. And I think he can attack the rim. And I think that's the thing, right? Like I love that Caleb Love was not afraid to take shots in big moments, right? Like I do love that about him. And I know he struggled in the tournament, but I'm still – I still revere the kid. I think he's he, he was exactly what Arizona he was needed. He's on the Wooden Award somebody. list as one of the 10 best players. Yeah. That's good. He needed Arizona needs somebody that wasn't going to be afraid of these moments. Um, and to his credit, he wasn't. They're going to need somebody next year that's not going to be afraid of these moments. I don't think I I don't think Jaden Bradley will be the nope. type of player that will be afraid of these moments anymore because I think he stepped up in such a big way in the tournament that I think he, he, he's got that dog in him now, and he knows that, like, I, I'm that dude. I yeah. can be that dude. And so I'm excited about that, but I still think he needs another tandem teammate at whatever level, whatever position, to be that alternate to him, to also have that dog, much like Khalid and Damon, mm -hmm. uh, Bibby and Simon. Like, everybody needs that, that secondary player that's going to help them out. And so I'm hoping uh, St. On's going to be that dude. Yeah, then one other player, and this is when you have an abundance of riches, a top 30 player that not a lot of people are talking about, Jamari Phillips, that has uh, been playing in your neck of the woods up there in Phoenix. Um, Jamari Phillips' dad, big fan of the show. We're a big fan of him as well. Um, listen, 
uh, the only thing with Jamari is I think he can score at all three levels. I'm bigger on on him, or I'm bigger with him than I think some scouts are. I think he's going to be a multi-year player, but he's another one. He's got a little bit of a dog to him, and uh, again, you need dudes that can score, and especially when you're a three-level scorer from three mid-range and get into the, a bucket, you can always use dudes like that. Um, I don't know quite what to expect from him, but I still think that he's going to be a very valuable piece. It might, maybe not quite a starter this year, but down the road, another one, Saul, when you're Arizona and you get a top 30 player and he's kind of forgotten about, that's a good thing. It's a great thing. It's a great thing. How many times have we forgotten about top 30 players that have come into the program and we've seen them excel over the years? Right. Uh, Jason Terry came in and nobody really thought much about him, especially after his first year. And then all of a sudden, you know, by the time he's a senior, he's a he's an All-American player of the year and he's in the ring of honor, right? right? And so that's what you're hoping for with with some of these kids. I'm not really familiar with Jamari's game as much as you are. Um, I, I haven't had an opportunity to go down the street and watch him play, you know, uh, especially being up here in Phoenix. I'm interested to see, you know, I've seen the highlights and I've seen a couple little clips in terms of gameplay, but I'm not sure what to expect from him either. And so I'm kind of in the same boat as you. Again, Tommy is such a good developer of talent. Yeah. And I think that's the thing you got to hang your hat on. It's different because Luke, to me, was also a great developer of talent. Sean, to me, was not as much a great developer of talent as he was trying to fit you into his scheme. And there's two big differences there. Trying to develop skills for an individual player to get them to play in an elite level, regardless of scheme, is kind of what I think Tommy Lloyd is all about. Whereas Sean Miller was trying to develop you to run the fucking pack line defense and that's it. Right. right. And so that's, that's, there's, there's a big difference there. And when you, when you train people to fit your system, you're not necessarily training them to develop over the years to become the best version of themselves, which ultimately hurts your program. And the reason why you see the inconsistency sometimes in the Sean Miller era in terms of getting to elite eight and then, not making it to the tournament or making it to the tournament and so on and so forth. So I think Tommy Lloyd's got that in his bag and I, I'm very confident in what he could do in terms of development with his team. I, I am as well. Emmanuel Steven, um, I expect him to redshirt or not play a ton this year. He Arizona's got big men. They redshirted this year that I expect to, uh, to play. He will be very good. And I do love, I love Jamari Phillips. All right. Nicholas Ibarra. I like Nicholas Ibarra, but he's beating me up a lot here. I love Jamari Phillips. You could again, Tweet at his dad and ask who the biggest fan of his son's game is, and he will definitely answer that it's me. I'm just, listen, man, sometimes you get a little bit more information. You you talk with a few people that say, we really like the, you know, theoretically, we really like the guy. We think he's going to be really good, but, you know, there are some players that he's going to have to beat out. I'm just passing that along, man. I like that. That's every school, though. Right. That's every okay. school. It doesn't matter if you're the number one recruit.